Chris, Nick, we're engineers on the cloud platform team for Atlassian. I'll just give you a quick rundown of what we do there. Um, and we'll explain what, how we are deploying OPA. Um, I'd, say, I'd say OPA, not OPA, because it's easier. All right. And we assume you're familiar with OPA. Um, I saw the hands up. Looked like everybody had their hands up earlier. I'll just continue. All right. Many of you may know our products, like Jira, Confluence, Trello, Bitbucket, and Status Page, and other things. Those don't matter. Um, we matter. We're the cloud platform. We make that possible so you can use it on the cloud. All right. Um, if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't work. Um, if they're not working, it's their fault, not ours. All right. All right. Um, the cloud platform. Um, it's mostly built on top of AWS. Um, we also have our own Kubernetes clusters that we built in-house. Um, if you attended KubeCon last year, you probably saw Nick Young's talk on why you shouldn't build your own Kube cluster. Um, yeah, when we did it, um, at the time, there were no cloud offerings for it. Um, now there are. And so we're evaluating what, what to do with that. I don't know if they're going to talk about that during this conference or not, but you can come, to bar, come by our booth and talk to our team there if you want to know our lessons learned um, in running our own Kube cluster and why we're uh, making the switch over. Um, Envoy is up there. We utilize Envoy as well. Uh, we've been deploying it across our fleet of services um, to fit. Ooh, how do I explain it? It's kind of like the way Pinterest did it. Um, basically, we deployed it independent of like Istio and such, and we have our own control plane, which I'll kind of explain a bit later about that. And OPA is going to be deployed alongside that, but also independently of that, because we have a pretty heterogeneous ecosystem at Atlassian. We have things that run on-premise, things that run in the cloud on AWS, things that run all over the world, and they're all just architected differently for different purposes, right? All right, um, I'll just share you some quick numbers. The, we run services in thousands, and we have that, tens of thousands of instances, but um, I wanted to put those numbers up there, but I was told I shouldn't. The Eagle doesn't like that. Um, fine. Um, I would, so I'm just putting up broad numbers. Requests per hour, billions. Requests per second, peak, millions. Um, that's across our clusters of services. Um, you know, yeah, again, legal. Um, I shouldn't have told them I'm doing these slides. They, when they found out, they were like, no. All right. Um, our topics, why OPA? Um, the control plane and data plane. For OPA, um, was it three years now? Two KubeCons ago? Um, I think I saw Torrin's talk on OPA introducing it, and I became interested. And so it took us two years because project planning, priorities, and all this stuff to get things even going. Um, and the reason why we chose it, because our performance settings proved that it worked pretty well. Um, there are some things you can do, of course, improve the performance locally, like caching and whatnot. Um, tooling. Um, Last year, I recall seeing all the tooling, um, which were the built-in tools for like Visual Studio Code and such, which were pretty cool. Um, a lot of other tools didn't have that available. Um, integration and extensibility, um, because we ran Kubernetes, they at the time had admission controllers and other ability to integrate it with things like PAM on hosts. And extensibility is really what's important because um, we knew kind of from the get-go that we would have to utilize um, the agent, but maybe not stand alone, but as part of a larger ecosystem built into other code. And the community, um, it was pretty important for us that there was a community around it. When we started looking at it, it was before incubation, I think, right? And now it's, what's after incubation? Eh, whatever. All right, control plane. Um, so the way we deployed OPA, um, on all the hosts, there's an OPA agent. The OPA agent is deployed per host, and we distribute our um, policies to it, and we get logs and metrics out of it. Um, I'll walk through each of these particular points here. Uh, the policies are submitted to the registry, which you see in the bottom right, and then distributed to the agents via CDN. Um, I had mentioned earlier that we run everything on AWS, and what you see here really is CloudFront in the blue, and is that red? It's not blue either. That's not blue? Oh, I'm colorblind. <laughs> uh, 
Purple is the CDN, which is cloud front, and S3 is the bucket there. Our registry pushes stuff into the, the bucket, and it does a validation and everything else of the policies on submission. Um, Will is there? Uh, yeah. And we also tag them. So um, our deployments go across multiple environments, dev, pro, staging, and prod, um, different AWS regions, US East, West, et cetera. And so we target our policies to go to different deployments for s different locations for our service. Um, it's kind of like using, was it labels in Kubernetes to target deployments? Um, yep. All right. Um, we actually do things slightly different in terms of how we get policies there. So we have two, set, two sets of policies, um, platform policies and service policies. Um, the platform policies define things that we want across the entire platform or a particular segment of the platform, right? Um, things that um, basically um, puts in some base rules so that way every service gets, um, has some base layer of policies applied to them. And then service owners, the people that run to build the services and deploy them, can then write their own rules and their own data for those policies. All right. Logging. Um, so uh, if you've utilized um, OPA, you know it emits logs for the decisions that were done, the decision logs. Um, however, we have our own logging infrastructure at um, Atlassian. Um, it's mostly built on top of, well, it's previously Fluent D, but we've replaced that with our own inbuilt logging. Um, driver for containers, and all that sho shoves everything into uh, AWS uh, Kinesis firehoses, which we then do have filters and branches out from. Um, as you can see here, two of the branches is, one is the uh, S3 bucket and Splunk. We send all our decision logs down to the S3 buckets, um, and we have other tooling which will process those um, logs um, to do analysis and other things. In fact, um, our security intelligence teams will be brought, processing those buckets to also gain intelligence on access and understand where there may have been some vulnerabilities at any given point. Um, let me see. All right, um, this is a quick example. Um, all our logs are structured, JSON logs, and we actually, because the logs are emitted from the host, we actually augment all the logs with additional data about the host. Um, as you can see, the EC2 there identifies the host name. I, redacted some other things like IPs and other things in there, um, other things to address it. But you can see we attach all that and we actually take the um, decision log itself and pl place it into a, a separate field in the logs itself. All right, and with this, we actually get a nice fortuitous loop, right? So a developer develops their um, policy bundles and such, they deploy them, it gets validated on our distribution plane and that gets distributed over to the OPA agents out in production or in development environments. And in turn, the decision logs come back into our logging pipeline, which the developer can then grab for their individual services and they do things like replays and whatnot. So they can modify their, um, their policies locally, um, grab the logs, and see exactly how that would change and affect their service. All right, and there's the last bit here, which is metrics. I um, added this one, um, OPA um, works within the Kubernetes environment ecosystem, right? Which is mostly like Prometheus and such. Um, we don't run Prometheus for our infrastructure, we run StatsD and have our StatsD metrics shipped over to SignalFX. And so we had to make modifications so we actually can get those stats out um, of the OPA agent into StatsD. All right, do you wanna talk about the data plane? Cool. So Nick sure. will talk, about, talk about the data plane. I think you might have stolen a bit of the thunder of what I was gonna say, but whatever. So yeah, basically uh, the, the way we try and uh, deploy services in terms of the network, uh, this, is, this is sort of, I'll just clarify, this is the in progress way we're doing our network at Atlassian. Um, so basically we have your, your customer segment, so the data that you have in the products uh, that's segmented away from uh, demilitarized zone, basically, uh, and then the internal segment, which has our internal services and things that developers make in their like 20% time and that sort of stuff. Uh, basically, you know, everything that has a hexagon, which is not the you know, most obvious thing, but everything that has a hex hexagon here runs OPA in some form. So the main gateways all run OPA. Uh, lots of the internal nodes uh, run OPA to make particular decisions for the services that are running on those nodes. 
Uh, and on the nodes, uh, we have something internally that we've, we call Sloth. So before we started running OPA, we had this thing called Sloth, which was service layer authentication, um, because we like making nice names for our things. Uh, and so it was doing authentication uh, based on things like uh, we have our own internal you know, wrapper around Kerberos, which does staff authentication, SAML authentication, uh, service to service authentication. Uh, and so it would authenticate any of those sort of things, build authentication. That's the fourth one. Uh, we also authenticate our CI CD systems so that they're able to talk to particular services. Uh, and so Sloth manages all those authentication. Uh, mechanisms and then passes the information that it gathers from that authentication uh, to OPA, uh, and that's the sort of authorization plugin. Uh, so we uh, deploy OPA in sort of two separate ways, which I think is on the next slide, so I will skip until then. Um, and then we sort of audit the decisions. So internally, you know, we have uh, auditing around uh, either decision logs and also things like, you know, uh, access. access logs. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, so, so similar to, to uh, the way Pinterest described, uh, we have sort of separate deployment models. Actually, that's a slightly different, oh, whatever. Um, so we have, you know, on, on our microservices, we have Sloth, which is its own ingress, uh, and it can run OPA inside of, uh, inside is just because we write in Golang, and so we can just import it and just run it uh, inside of our sidecar, which is excellent. Uh, we also have the uh, sort of separate models. So again, uh, similar sort of thing to, to what Pinterest described, where users have a uh, sort of complicated thing that they want to do. We can just expose the decision uh, port uh, on, on the sidecar, and then they can write up whatever that they want and send whatever inputs and queries they want to actually make those decisions. Uh, and finally, we have the, the gateways and proxies, those big hexagons on that uh, thing that's sort of you know, making you know, large-scale decisions about whether this internal service can actually go and access customer data and that sort of thing. Uh, cool. You stole this slide from me. Um, so the way we do policies uh, in Alassian is uh, as we, we run a platform, basically the way we try and do things is that we treat most of our customers, uh, internal customers, sort of like an 80%. There's an 80% use case, and they want to do fairly basic things. They don't really want to worry about writing Rego policies. They don't want to, want to get into the nitty-gritty details. Uh, and so what we've done is sort of wrap OPA for that 80%. Uh, so basically, they just define some static JSON that we define a schema for. Uh, we convert that schema into something that we can interpret as part of our platform policy. You know, so do things like, so, yeah, okay, it is. Cool, I'm just gonna use this slide, it's much easier to explain. Um, but yeah, so we convert something that they write, which has just got like, you know, it's got a bunch of arrays in it and a bunch of nice things around, uh, you know, staff and groups and that sort of thing. And then we just explode that out into um, something that is slightly more efficient to execute. Um, and as part of that, they can also, in a similar manner, write tests in a JSON schema as opposed to in Rego files. Um, and in the same way, we just convert that into Rego files, execute all the tests for them, and then we'll just give them back a yes or no and what went wrong and what went right, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but it sort of abstracts away a bit of the, the sort of needing to know exactly how to write Rego files for people who aren't necessarily as interested in it and just want to write you know, products and do that sort of thing. Um, but on the flip side, for the 20% of people who are interested in writing Rego and all those sorts of things, uh, we can basically do you know, custom policies where they can just define whatever Rego they want. Uh, we sort of accept that thing uh, and they can just upload that. We include that directly inside of our platform policy uh, and then send that all on through to, uh, to OPA in terms of uh, two separate bundles that OPA will download and execute the decisions and those sorts of things. Uh, one thing they call out here is, yeah, that the, uh, actually, you stole that from me. Never mind. Already mentioned uh, the security wanting to do um, sort of regular things. But one other thing to call out is that uh, the, one of the big drivers behind us going towards uh, OPA and using this sort of thing is uh, visibility for security teams in terms of if someone has these credentials, what can they actually access? 
you know, with, uh, with microservices exploding and that sort of thing. Basically, everyone would define their whitelists inside of their code or in some static configuration or application.yaml. Uh, and it made it very difficult for security to work out, like, if this box got owned, what does it actually have access to? Um, and so uh, moving towards OPA and standardizing on a single uh, policy platform, it allows us to view to basically who can access absolutely everything across the thousands of instances and services uh, across Atlassian. Yeah. That was very fast. Yeah. Um, OK, speeded through that. But um, that basically wraps it up. So are there any questions? Oh, by the way, you can always catch us on the Slack. No questions? Thank you, no question. OK, well, I'll ask one. Um, <laughs> oh. Yeah, so you guys talked about uh, OPA in the, uh, in the Kubernetes use case quite a bit. Are you using it at all for configuration of the underlying cloud infrastructure? No. Yeah, it's only um, currently used for the authorization um, into uh, services and other and hosts currently. Um, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that normalizing on OPA allows your security teams to better understand the blast radius of any given host getting owned. Um, is there any particular tooling you're using that allows you to, like, evaluate a traversal of a bunch of policies, or is, is this just manually looking, like reading everything? Currently, it is a largely manual process. Uh, there are plans for building out tooling around that sort of thing, um, and reading in all the policies from our you know, CDN and all that sort of stuff and working that out, but we don't ha currently have that kind of tool. Okay, well, my question was, yeah, you mentioned a couple of times the platform team versus the, the development teams. Uh, do you have, like, examples that you can share based on legals, what you think legal would be happy with? <laughs> uh, examples of policies that maybe the platform team would want to enforce sort of uh, more universally? Yeah. Um, so uh, platform and the security team both want to lock down access to the services, both for, both for ingress and egress. So we utilize the policies to basically restrict it, um, and we utilize that um, as a baseline. Um, so services can then provide uh, policies which can then grant access to the individual nodes and services um, for end users or customers or even our support team. Right? The uh, policies uh, that, um, I guess one of the things we were concerned about is being like being owned. Um, we, we do these, um, what do you call them, red team exercises off quite often. And we do these bug bounties. And um, so we're quite aware of when, like our vulnerabilities. And some, some of them is just network vulnerabilities, right, and access to the system. So one of the things security really wanted was the ability for us to lock down access to individual services so people cannot traverse the network from one box to the other or via services. So one way to do that is if we realize a credential is owned, we can actually um, roll out a policy really quickly to lock that out. And then, of course, do things like um, expired credentials, because sometimes authentication credentials have a longer life than we necessarily like. Um, so we just use a policy to lock it. Very, very cool. Anybody else? OK, let's thank our speakers.